This is your ticket to dream, to dream the impossible dream. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. My homiletics professor used to say, if a parable seems straightforward and simple, then you should probably spend more time with it. On the surface, today's gospel reading seems to be focused on money and greed, and that God doesn't want you to save your money, God wants you to give it away. We hear a man first asking Jesus to settle an inheritance dispute. Tell my brother to give me my fair share of the estate. And Jesus replies, I'm not going to get in the middle of your family drama. No way. But he uses the man's request as an opportunity to teach the crowd that's gathered. Listen up for everyone who's, who can hear me. Don't be greedy. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then to reinforce this point, he told the parable about a rich man who had more goods than he knew what to do with. And instead of giving away, he decided to build even larger containers to, that he currently has to then keep everything for himself storing up and ensuring a good life for years to come. And on the surface, it sounds like God is saying, you fool, you've done the wrong thing. You can't keep that wealth. Give it away. You're being too greedy and you're not doing my will. On the surface, again, relatively simple parable. Keeping things is bad. Giving away things is good. While this may be true for some people in some circumstances, this simple message I don't think is what Jesus is teaching his followers. Instead, if we spend a little bit more time with the text, we will find that this passage is less about greed and wealth and more about how to be good stewards of the many gifts and blessings that God gives us. Who here bought a lottery ticket this past week? Be honest. God's watching. I don't normally make it a habit of buying lottery tickets, but I, like many of you, am a product of getting caught up in the media frenzy surrounding the third largest jackpot of all time, $1.26 billion to that lucky winner. And I saw messages all over the place encouraging me to, to purchase a ticket. You can't win if you don't play. Imagine just what a couple of bucks can do for you. And then my favorite one, which was the clincher, this is your ticket to dream, to dream the impossible dream. Knowing my odds and trying to be realistic, I did buy a ticket at 7-Eleven just down the street on Friday while running errands. I did not go out of my way to go purchase this ticket, but I was out. <laughs> but I don't know about you, but after I got the ticket, once I had it in my hands and I saw all the numbers, my mind started playing that what-if game. What if I actually won? What could that mean for me? Ooh. And it could happen. I have just as much chance of winning as anyone else that purchases the ticket. I'm not going to feel guilty for thinking about what I would do with that money. All the things that I would buy, how my life would change, what I could do with all that money. That is, after all, my ticket to dream my impossible dream. If the consistent and overuse of first-person pronouns sounds familiar, it's because you just heard them used by the man in the parable from today's reading. A closer reading of the gospel reveals that this rich man has been given a blessing. His land produced abundantly, a high-yield bump crop. He wasn't expecting it, nor did he need it. His land simply yielded much more than it usually did. It's like he had won the lottery. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I don't have enough space to store the crops itself. And then he said, I'm going to do this. 
I'm going to pull down my current barns and build larger ones. And I'm going to store up all of it, my grains, my goods. And I will say to my soul, don't worry about a thing. We are good. I got mine. While part of this lesson is not to hoard your goods and keep everything for yourself, I think Jesus is also teaching us at a bare minimum that God wants to be a part of the conversation. Remember just last week, in the chapter just before this, we heard Jesus teaching the Lord's Prayer, teaching to his followers to bring everything to God, to become closer with God in relationship. Sound familiar, right? Bring it to God? Good. Instead of the man having a conversation with himself, which is what's happening here, not inviting anyone else into the conversation, he didn't know what to do with his blessing, and he did what he felt was right for him, only relying on his own intellect and his own decision-making abilities. No other conversation partners And I wonder how different this conversation would have looked if he had invited God into it. Instead of asking himself, what should I do with my goods? What if he had asked God this? God, I've been given this massive blessing. I know all blessings come from you and I'm truly thankful. Help me to discern what to do. Help me to remember those who are less fortunate. Help me to remember and know that these are not my high-yield crops, but yours, that you have given me to be a good steward of. Help me to remember that that I am just one of your many servants that are doing your will. And it is much greater than anything. Your will is much greater than anything that I could possibly imagine or dream. Help me to trust and have faith that in my giving away your blessing, you will continue to bless me today and always to provide for me in the future, just as you've done in the past. Help me to realize that without your help and guidance, this treasure that has been given to me is actually a burden, that it is too much for one person to manage or handle. And that the more I invite your help and the help of others, the more I'm able to live into your blessing rather than my own burden. As 11 p.m. was getting closer on Friday evening, my anxiety was sky high. The reality of potentially winning the lottery was setting in, and I was getting nervous. I was like, how, what, what am I going to do? I started regretting my decision to, uh, for the purchase of the ticket. What if I would actually win? Instead of getting excited about the prospect of having the ability and means to be as carefree as I like, I went in the opposite direction. I was feeling this huge burden, a weight that I actually didn't have the capacity or skill or anything to feel like I would be able to handle the actual logistics of winning $1.26 billion. I was afraid. I started thinking, if I win, I'm going to have to keep this a secret. (laughs) I desperately don't want people to view me differently. I like my life. I don't want it to change drastically. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to remain anonymous. In Maryland, you're allowed to do that. And I'm going to protect myself and others by holding on to the treasure. I'm going to isolate. No one needs to know. And the more I thought about it, the more the spiral went down, 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 the more I was having a conversation with just myself, the more anxious I became. Finally, I couldn't handle anymore, and I reached out to a friend via text, and I told them how I was feeling. After they replied, LOL, (laughs) you are ridiculous, they then were helpful and sent me a link to an article, news article entitled, 
so you won the lottery, now what? And then underneath that, they texted, you wouldn't be alone. The first thing you should do is ask for help. The article, I learned, is that, like me, the average person doesn't have the capacity or knowledge to handle such a great blessing and responsibility. Step one is to reach out for help. Get professional advice. Find a lawyer, a financial advisor. Find someone who can build a team that can support you and this massive blessing that's been given to you. Potentially even be a wonderful steward of God's great gift. I know it's going to come to a shock to hear this, but I didn't win the lottery (laughs) on Friday. This sermon isn't about the lotto. It's about God's gifts and blessings that we receive all the time, every day, each and every one of us. To a certain extent, we all have our health. We're here right now. We have food enough to nourish us. We have wealth enough to secure us. As an example, right before the communion, At the offering, when I lift up those big metal plates, and I say, what do I say? All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thy own have we given thee. We believe all good things come from God. In this church, in this place, we don't use first-person pronouns. When making decisions about what we believe and what we pronounce to be true during this service, rarely does it begin with I. When we affirm our faith, for example, in reciting the Nicene Creed, by the way, which is full of really big ideas, and on my worst days, don't believe all of it. Thank God it doesn't begin with, I believe in God the Father. It begins in, we believe in God the Father Almighty. At our baptism today, wherever Mr. River is, all of you will be asked, Will you do all in your power to support this person who's about to be baptized? The response is not I will, but we will, this collected community. Yes, we're going to be taking on response, individual responsibility to help this little person, but we're also responding with the confidence that it's not just us, it's all of us together raising up this child in Christ. It's not just their parents or their godparents. It takes a village to raise up someone in the full stature of Christ that we are about to say. And even in those slim times when we do respond I instead of we, it's in our baptismal covenant that we're also going to be renewing today when we hear big questions like, will you continue in the apostles' teaching? Will you strive for justice for all? It's not I will, period. It is I will, with God's help. It comes with this comforting word of assistance that we're not just us doing it. We're not expected to know it all. We're expected to be in conversation with God and others. We may not be winning the lottery, but we are receiving blessings. And if we allow ourselves to remember that we are part of something much bigger, that we, are supposed to know, that we are not supposed to know all the answers about what to do with the gifts that we are given. That we are not to isolate, but rather reach out. Then it's going to be, with God's help and the help of others, that each of these blessings is going to be a ticket to not our dream, but God's dream. A dream where the impossible will be made possible and God's dream, God's will is going to become a reality. Amen.